I'm Linda Lawrence. Um, I'm an IA. Um, I've been in that position for 20 years. I work at Andover High School. I also have um, my son Alex is, is on the spectrum. Uh, so this is professional and personal for me. And um, again, uh, the three of us have been a team for a very long time. And that's why we're presenting together. Yep. Yeah, I'm Helen Fitzgerald. I'm a speech and language pathologist at Andover High School. Um, I've worked with students across all ages and um, as well as with adults. So Steph is right. We all tend to work together, the three of us as a team. And what we have found over, I can't even say how many years now, <laughs> a bunch. A bunch. Uh, is that we are much more effective together. So um, that is a part of the reason why we do this is because we believe that everyone is a vital part of the team. So that's me, Steph. So like Linda and Helen, I teach at Andover High School. Um, I've been there for 18 years and I teach in both substantially separate classes, um, some of whom are completely made up of kids on the spectrum. Um, I teach, and I also teach inclusion classes in biology and physical science. Um, and I have worked with IAs my entire uh, career, and they have saved my life on numerous occasions. So I really, um, I'm so glad you're all here. Yes. All right. So look at that. Okay. Steph? Okay. So there are two things that we based this workshop around. Um, and that is really getting a, a deeper meaning of what autism, the autism spectrum is and what are the manifestations of people who are on the spectrum. And then we hope by the end of the workshop, you'll have learned um, a number of strategies. Um, we're presenting more than four or five, but if, if you, whatever you pick up, we'll be really happy. Um, um, and these strategies are designed to help uh, students on the spectrum succeed in the classroom. Yeah, we, uh, we understand and we know a lot about the presentation literature that tells us that you'll remember something from the beginning and something from the end and the middle will be like blah, 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 unless we say something funny. <laughs> so um, you will have a copy of the PowerPoint to refer back to and we are hopeful that you take away a few strategies that you can start using right away. That, that's pretty important. And the other thing is we hope this validates a lot of what yes. you're already doing. Right. Because a lot of these strategies are just good approaches to working yes. with kids on the spectrum, but also with working with other kids as well. Yep. Um, okay, so before we get started, I mean, we're really happy that you're here uh, to learn about the things that we're passionate about. Um, but we, at the beginning of all our presentations, we have a basic online agreement that we just want to uh, go through really quickly. Um, so please uh, mute your microphones uh, at this point, but keep your video cameras on. We want this to be interactive and we'd like to see you um, so that we can all engage. Um, that being said, if you need to do something to go some, you know, to, to take care of something important, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, the same thing, please limit the use of cell phones during the workshop. But again, if something ha comes up, we're all at home, go take care of it. Um, if you normally are a person like the three of us who talk a lot, um, step back a little in the discussion. But if you're someone who's usually quiet, please push yourself and step forward a little bit. Um, does everybody know how to turn on and off your video um, and how to mute? Okay, well, um, the other thing is we're going to answer your questions, but please put them in the chat function or uh, raise your hand with the hand raise function. Um, we will get to your questions. We will try very hard um, not to lose any, um, but 
we'll answer them when it's a, a reasonable break in, in the presentation. Um, we're going to have a quick break about halfway through the presentation, again, so that you can take care of what you need to. Um, we really expect that you'll interact. It's important for, for everybody here to hear other, other people's experiences and other people's um, knowledge about this. I know the three of us always learn something from every time yes, we yeah. present. Yep. So um, we really do expect you all to participate as best you can. Um, we don't have um, the luxury of walking around the room or encouraging strategies or making eye contact. So again, requiring participation is kind of our way around, around this. Um, and we also want you to experience the um, classroom experience of your students when they are called on to participate as well. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And just for a quick Zoom review, um, at the bottom of your screen, if you go to the very bottom, you'll see um, participants. There are now 24 of you here, which is great. Um, find your name on the sidebar, click more, and you'll see the raised hand icon. Um, for your chat box, and again, you've, most of you have found the chat box, which is great. Um, you go to the more button, you click on chat, and the sidebar is where you type in. And don't forget to hit enter um, to send a message to the chat. That's what I always do. I type it in, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and I forget to push enter, so don't forget to push enter. Um, in the participants, there's also a yes, no button. Um, there's a go slower, go faster. There's a like, dislike, need a break. So if we run over and we don't give you a break, that would be where you push the need a break <laughs> button. Um, and then um, when we go into a breakout room, there's in the more function, there's an ask for help. And that will bring us into the breakout room. And we have a breakout room coming up in a little while. So uh, again, you may, you'll see it then. Okay. Hi, Linda. Okay, so um, this is the, from the CDC. Autism spectrum disorder is a developmental disability that can cause significant social communication and behavioral challenges. Um, they may interact, communicate, behave and learn in ways that are different than most people. The learning, thinking and problem solving abilities with ASD can range from gifted to severely challenged. Okay, so um, when the DSM-5 came out, we did away, they did away with all the categories, low functioning, high functioning, Asperger's, um, NOS, PDD, 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 yeah. PDD, yeah, PDD, NOS, which is what my son has been diagnosed with. And let me tell you that it's just like, okay, he's got something and we don't know what it is. So we're going to stick him in here. Um, I am a big fan of the DSM-5 um, because I think it is a continuum and um, putting people into specific categories depends upon who your diagnostician is. And it can change depending on if you see somebody new. Um, my son was always, um, when he was six and up, they kept saying he was Asperger's. And I said, no, because he did not develop language naturally. It came with kicking, screaming, and a lot of battles. Um, so I, I like the continuum better. And um, you want to always check for specific accommodations in the IEP. And different strategies um, will be more relevant for different levels of, of autism impairment. Okay, so 
Um, you, you guys all know this. Um, difficulty with social interactions and reading social cues. That's really the defining for the whole spectrum. Um, filtering comments. That's a huge one. Um, and it's often associated with behavior routines, anxiety, language difficulties. Um, one of the things about behavior routines, you, you don't want them to become too dependent on those. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a, a really gradual process um, of not you know, not letting them do the same thing, play with the same toy in the same way every single time. Yeah, right. When we think about cognitive flexibility, we want our students who crave and need structure and routine to have those because they really do learn. It's a touch point for these guys. On the, but if, like anything, if they come to over rely on the routines um, because of that lack of cognitive flexibility, then it can be much more difficult to branch off and do new things. So it really is a fine line there. All right. So this, um, this, the statistics that I'm going to go over um, come from the CDC um, 2020 Community Report on Autism, but it's as of 2016. Um, the analysis before that was from 2014, and it was at that point they would, were saying one in 59 or one in 60 people are on the autism spectrum. Now they're saying it's one in 54. Um, it occurs across the board, um, and it's four more, uh, four more times more common in boys than in girls. Hispanic kids on the spectrum are identified at lower rates compared to white and black students. Black and Hispanic children with ASD get their evaluations later than white children with ASD. And black and Hispanic children with ASD and intellectual disability are also diagnosed at a later age than white children with ASD and intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. All right, so when we look at development, when you're working with your students, you really need to keep these four areas in mind. These are um, pretty important, and these are the areas that we often see significant difficulties, or we see difficulties in these areas at different levels, depending on the level of severity of your student. But in general, you're going to see these kind of areas. So we look at gaze. Gaze is um, one of the earliest forms of communication. Like with infants, that's what they do. They look, they look at things. They use it to initiate interactions. They seek out faces. So this is really important, this idea of gaze. <clears throat> For a lot of our students, just getting them to look and use joint attention to gaze together might be a step that we have to take. For our students who are, um, are higher functioning, they often miss cues because they don't have that level of gaze that they need. So gaze is a big thing, believe it or not, and it is a form of communication. So keep that one in mind. Um, and then this idea of joint attention. This is when we can look at and think about the same thing very early on is when infants start to develop this. You know, when you think about it, think about your own children or little kids you work with, they'll point at something or we point and say, look, look at this. And everybody looks together. Now we're looking and thinking about the same thing. Joint attention is the beginning of interaction. It's the beginning of conversation and it's the beginning of shared experiences. So that's really important. Uh, this next one, neurodevelopment. This is huge because what we know is that brain structure and experiences are connected. They're interconnected. So the brain builds itself in response to the stimuli, the external internal experiences that are happening. 
So when you're working with students, particularly when they're little, this is very, very important. We want them to have interactive experiences. Really important because we know that what's happening outside is helping shape what's happening inside. So when you have trouble with all three of these pieces, the gaze, the attention, or you are, you know, the development is not happening in a way that we want, um, it leads to not paying attention to the social world. Right? And that's, again, look at this as one of those big hallmarks. We need our students to pay attention to the social world to begin with so that we can help them <clears throat> interact within the social world. <clears throat> and then that leads us to this idea of theory of mind. So many of our students run into trouble because of this idea of theory of mind. That's understanding that other people have thoughts that are different from your own, different and separate. So if you're going to accommodate other people, if you're going to predict their future behavior, if you're going to manipulate them, if you're going to please them, you have to have this inbuilt capacity to understand and guess something about who they are and what they might do or what they want. So we need theory of mind, again, in order to really develop strong and rich social interactions. So in anything you do with any of your students, no matter what level they're on, these are the areas that you should be keeping in the back of your mind, kind of as a broad umbrella here. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to go into a breakout room. And basically, we just want you to talk about students that you've worked with. We're only going to do this for about five minutes, but just kind of so I want you to, we all want you to get a sense of how different all of our students are. So I want you to think about the similarities and differences of the students with whom you work. Just talk about them a little bit. And then when we come back together, I'll ask one person from each group to kind of give us an idea of what, what you talked about. Okay. Then, okay. So let's just, let's just have a conversation about what, um, what happened in those breakout rooms? You know, did you find similarities and differences? And well, I, what, I, what was what I noticed in the conversation was that there's uh, a broad range of characteristics wow. of of people who have um, autism. Um, you know, as we all know, that the range can be from um, to the point where um, they might be determined to have cognitive intellectual disability on top of autism all the way up through bring brilliant like um, people um, and um, and although I had spoke of one person um, one student that I had that was uh, although they it's hard for them to interpret certain cues um, this person was uh, would study people and no, and he would tell me he would learn ways of manipulating them people. <laughs> And, he's, and he would tell me how he manipulates people. And so it was, it's very interesting, um, the different ranges that, that people, and also uh, some, pe some people in our group spoke of uh, uh, kids, younger kids, autism as being very lovable, but at the same time, certain things will set them off, such mm -hmm. as no, a sound, loud noise, and they can become, uh, or they can spit, bite, and become um, you know, aggressive. Yes, right. Um, we'll be talking about that. There are some real sensory issues that can happen to people. Um, the other thing is we'll talk about it a little later, but all of those, all of those behaviors are actually communicating something. So if you think back to our screen um, a few back, it says you have to have a thick skin. You have to like you can't take these things personally, <laughs> you know, because um, everyone's going to have a bad day, and and sometimes our students have some very difficult reactions. But yeah, so many different types of people, right? Mm -hmm. And everyone has autism. Um, mm -hmm. I do agree with Linda that it is nice that with the DSM-5, now we recognize this, that yes, you have autism, but there is a very wide range of severity levels. So. And one thing, I, I, one thing I want to say, last thing that one of the uh, of our people in our group had mentioned that struck me was that she had said that uh, they they love us, the caretakers, and so they feel free to release a lot of the things that they wouldn't do with someone yes. or others yeah. because yeah. they love them. So the same 
student mm-hmm. who might spit or bite at the same time will hug and and yeah. and 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 um and show affection to the to um the person in the classroom, the educator. So because you're safe, you've created mm-hmm. this big space for them. You know, yeah, a bond. Right, you do. You create a bond. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that was our room three. So in breakout room one, we have Allison, Gina, Kimberly, Christina, Roseanne, and Walpina. Did one of you, um, was one of you chosen to speak? Yeah, it was me. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so we just did like a quick little um, list of just little characteristics that we noticed about our students. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, they all, all the students want to play but they played differently, um, you know, and they, in my room this happens too, but they have, they kind of choose their their buddy, their playmate, and that's like their person that they're comfortable playing with. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we had talked about, um, I wrote down middle school, but also, I mean, it happened in elementary school, and I said it happened with my own, my typical child. Um, you know, they were lonely during the COVID learning and they had a hard time adjusting, you know, it was out of their norm. It wasn't the same type of schedule. So they had a hard time. Um, and we also talked about how our students bond with their special people or their people that they're comfortable with. You know, they, you find a uh, common interest and, you know, they, you have this like, this bond with them. So those are just a few things that we had talked about in our group. Well, I think that it's wonderful that both groups so far brought up this idea that students with autism can bond. We get, often there's this myth that students with autism have no emotions, no feelings, and don't make connections, right? And that is just not accurate for so many of our students. So thank you for that. I really, that's really Um, important. Yeah. Okay. I'm also also glad you brought up the the issue with, Um, remote learning. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I found really interesting was that my one of my classes where there are five students all on the spectrum, um, while they struggled with it, they were present in class every minute. They worked really, really hard and they were, they were, I, I wasn't expecting that. And it was ac- it was wonderful to actually be with them um, because they and they miss being together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. they really do. Yeah. All right, group two: Chris, Joanne, Lan Lan, and Sunny. Did we have a spokesperson for that group? All right. How about Chris? Chris Vickery. I don't, we didn't choose anybody. I'm sorry. It's okay. Um, I think with um, our group, there are a a bunch of the people are just really trying to um, learn from the ground up here. Um, There's, I think there was a couple people that had a little bit of experience with it, but not an awful lot. Sure. Okay. So... So we're, but my, my own experience, um, I worked at uh, a special needs school. I mean, Gates Lane is primarily that. So I'm not sure, I don't want to overshadow the other people, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so I think what we're, what I'm hearing from you is that again, we're seeing that there is just, there's a wide range, right? There's like, a very wide range of, um, of what people's knowledge is and right. and then we're 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 kind of overwhelming them with the fact that there's going to be a, an enormous range of students interesting and different different arrays i apologize for not using the video i have a migraine so it's kind oh, of no. <laughs> working against oh, me here but wow. thank you for putting up with that of course of course oh, so oh, better oh, thank you for oh, thank no. you for coming even with us oh, oh, no 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 it's it's my jam it's what i do so thanks <laughs> uh, you bring up some important points we exactly. all have different levels of experience exactly. and comfort exactly. with students um with autism mm-hmm. and 
one of the things that I can say is that most likely for most of you, you will not be thrown into a situation where you need to understand every single level of severity at every single age, right? You will be in a specific setting with a specific group of kids. So um, I think our best advice to you is uh, start small. You know, every time you learn something, then you'll build on that. So, um, and they're all just people, you know, and that's the other thing. So bring all of the other skills that you bring to life to this and you'll be fine. All right, breakout room four, we have June, Kathleen, Kathy, Lupe, and that's it. So they picked, I got okay. picked. Um, <laughs> so I, I somewhat volunteered because I did it in the last one. That doesn't mean I always want to do it. But. Anyways, so, um, you know, the, the beginning discussion was that, you know, the one child that she had was very smart. Um, initially, he blended in. Mm -hmm. um, uh, very capable, but, she, you know, a big thing that, and he was very aware of everything that was going on in the classroom, pretty much everything out. Um, he was very capable of things, but as soon as the requirement for work came, he was an avoider. So he was like, oh, I need a break. Oh, but it's time to use the bathroom. And the same thing happened at home with, with the family. But it was, a, you know, very capable child. But, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Great. And, and it, sorry. Oh, go ahead. No, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, I had an, uh, um, a different a different child in my classroom. Mine's a, a regular classroom, and the, parent had re the parents had refused to believe anything was going on with their child. And, and we had yeah. one that was, um, he was, you know, the, the students had to go. It was either art or music, and we knew that children had to go. And, you know, I have three, four, and five-year-olds, and it was like the three-year-old wasn't going because it wasn't his turn. And he was determined. He's like, no, it's time to go. So he's grabbing the kid, and the kid was like, no. And he bit him because he was like, it was so determined right. that it's time for us to go. And that, so he just like, he couldn't break out of that idea that, that it wasn't time that, to go. That everybody was supposed to leave, not just not right. Just the uh, wow, you guys, your conversation was very rich. I'm not even sure to begin um, where to begin. It's, it's interesting for many of our students when they start out in the early grades, um, they can be pretty successful. And then as they get older and things become less structured, less, there's fewer, there's fewer routines in place um, and things become more abstract. A lot of our students then do start to fall apart. And that can be really difficult for the student, for uh, the people who work with them and for parents who are like, wait a minute, what happened? They were doing so well. Um, so we can see when things change in expectation and environment that things can become more difficult for some of our students with autism. Another thing you brought up is this idea of being in a classroom with other students um, and not being able to shift or being um, really needing to follow those rules and think about that in terms of theory of mind, right, or taking perspective. You, this person has decided and, and thinks everyone else thinks the same way or should think the same way um, and can't get past that. <clears throat> and then the frustration level comes and that, that level of biting is again, another behavior that is expressing something for us. You know, in this case, probably a huge level of frustration. Um, <clears throat> and then this idea of not doing the work. A lot of our students with autism have executive function issues they have a real hard time with producing any work. Sometimes the emotional regulation piece gets into place. Sometimes it is theory of mind. Why should I have to show the work? I know it, why should I have to show it? So, um, you know, again, all really, these are things that we see happening all the time. So thank you for that. All right, and breakout room five, Diane, Chris, Kristen, uh, Maria, and Patricia. Did you guys pick a? Trish, I think, did you want to do it? You can do it. Do you want to do it? You do it. <laughs> <laughs> I've never done it before. Okay. Um, I have faith in you. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. So do um, we, Diane. You're going to be awesome. Uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Our group uh, pretty much talked about, um, I, I have, uh, it sounds like everyone's got different ages. Yeah. I have four-year-olds and Trisha has three-year-olds. Um, we've been doing it for a while. Um, mm -hmm. We do have autistic children. We've had them over the years. I've seen from very uh, low functioning to very, very high functioning. 
yeah. this year. Um, I feel that the kids that we had this year that were making um, some improvements are probably not doing quite as well because they're not with other children now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's very hard. I have run into one parent who's really looking forward to starting school again, but it doesn't look like Everett's going to go back. It looks like Everett's going to be doing remote till at least after Halloween. So um, yeah. I don't know how that's gone, but we did talk about the similarities of the uh, autistic children we have. The mm -hmm. majority of the ones that we have that are similar uh, are pretty much no eye contact at all. Um, mm -hmm. do not, the majority also do not like to be touched. Yeah. Um, we do have one that doesn't mind it, um, mm -hmm. but he, he's a little different than the rest of them. Uh, most of them do play by themselves. They don't mm -hmm. really want to uh, blend with the other kids. And as um, one of the other girls had said, mm -hmm. what ends up happening is that when someone comes over, they want to play with them and, and they get upset because they'll take something that they have just trying to play and they think it's taken away from them. Right. Um, right. Also, yeah. Maria had also said she had a child last year who, if he came into the room, um, there was something on the board that shouldn't have been. He'd freak out. Certain music um, would turn them on. Hers were a little bit older, I think. Um, and uh, for mm. us also, if any changes in the room, if we move furniture around, um, it totally throws them off. Um, but they, yeah. the majority of them are very, very brilliant. Mm. And it's so it's so sad to see that they're that smart with a lot of things and their social skills is, seems to be the main problem with them. Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> you did very well, Diane. Thank you thank for that. Thank you. You guys brought up again so many points. Like, where do I start? Um, not being with other students, right? That's when big, we, right? When yeah. we talk about this idea that your experiences help drive your brain development, <laughs> kids need social experiences. You also know that the social brain, like so many other parts of the, our lives, if you don't use it, you lose it. Right. So it can be really difficult for these guys. So finding ways for them to be social now is really important. Um, it is. If they're in school or not, I'm telling all of my parents, um, get them on Zooms, have them talking to their parents, their grandparents, like, you know, cousins, friends, anyone, like get them having that level of social interaction, which is different from texting. So it is. It, it's just I find it. I find it in Everett though. We have a lot of very um, poor families that probably don't have the computers have or anything. Mm -hmm. I do yeah. know that at the end of the year, that uh, in March, April, the city of Everett did go out and purchase enough uh, mm -hmm. Chromebooks for everybody. Oh, that's good. Um, so they have it, but even with that, a lot of them didn't go on. Yeah. A lot of the parents mm -hmm. don't understand English. Yeah. Uh, it's very difficult for them. Um, I feel badly. I'm actually, I just went back to work two weeks ago on Monday and Fridays. Okay. Just, I work in an after school program and, yeah. and we have, we're, I'm working like two days, but I'm working 7.30 to 5.30 mm -hmm. and the, the um, requirements and all the, it, it's very strict, um, but yeah. we've, we've kept to no, you know, we've had no sicknesses. We, we take temperatures yeah. daily and the kids are totally thrilled to be back with their friends. Yeah. But we usually yeah. have 300 kids and we only have 100. Right. Each teacher so, eight can only have 10 <clears throat> kids in class. Right. So, but, again, this is going to be a huge change for our students. Very much so. All yeah. of the rules, things are going to change. They're not going to be the same as when they left. So, right. um, as you had said earlier, a lot of times just changing the room can, can really cause difficulty for a lot of our students. So, right. <clears throat> this is going to be a big change for them when we do go back. Um, the other thing, eye contact, I just want to talk about this for a minute. Um, <clears throat> a lot of our students don't make eye contact. A lot of people in general don't make eye contact. Eye contact can be very uncomfortable, not just for our students with autism, but for lots of people. People with social anxiety hardly ever make contact. If you're really thinking about something or you're nervous about something, we don't make eye contact. Um, we make more eye contact when we're a speaker, but when you're speaking, you speak and you look away and then you look back at people. Um, you make eye contact when you're a listener more, but we also, we don't go like this. 
right? Like, true, true. You know, we don't, when, and up for a long time in the field, we were talking about making kids um, use eye contact. And now, I like, don't make them use eye contact, right? No. We, we want them to use it in a more regular sense, like look at someone sometimes. So for my students, if they're really uncomfortable, I don't want them. If it's going to shut down their ability to communicate because they have to look in your eyes, then we don't want them to do that. So for, our, for a lot of our students, we tell them to just look in between, like look on my forehead, look at my nose. No one will ever know you're not looking in my eyes <laughs> if you do that. So um, keeping... Also, your, also your, if, your, if you're staring directly at someone, it can get pretty creepy. Yeah, right. And we don't want to be your aggressive. <laughs> All right. Is okay. that? I think that was it for that one. So, uh, again, thank you for all of this really wonderful um, input. This was awesome. Um, I just wanted to say for all the people that are just starting out with working with kids on the spectrum, you're going to learn a lot very quickly. <clears throat> um, and a few years down the road, you'll be saying, I wish I knew this then. Um, when my son had an IA in seventh and eighth grade, it was the first time she'd worked with someone with autism. And I saw her a couple years later and she said, I wish I knew when I was working with Alex, what I know now. Mm. Don't go there. Yeah. Okay. She was wonderful with him. Yeah. Um, maybe things would have been better. Maybe not who knows, but it's a learning process. So don't feel like you have to know everything right now because my kid's 29, mm -hmm. I'm still learning, okay? It never stops. Um, Amato is raising her hand, Helen. Yep, go right ahead. Are we saying oh. your name correctly? Yeah, Amato, yeah. Amato. <laughs> Um, also, um, I think what's really important is from a very young age uh, for parents is to rehearse what you do and what you say in given situations. And that's yeah. what I did with my son since yeah. he was very young. I said, well, when, you, when, this, when you're in this situation, this is what you say and this is what you do. And they right. do listen intently and they do it. And so at, when he was older, he sort of rehearsed in his mind from childhood what he needed to say at a given situation. Yeah. And also, uh, he's 37 years old, big, and has a beard and everything. And he, and he, he holds on to, to stuffed animals, plush animals. Animals, and he knows that it's unusual to do that. And so when people come by, he puts his plush animals away. Oh. And when he's around people he's comfortable with, he puts them in a big duffel bag and he unzips them and takes them out and holds on to them. You know, when we're in, in the apartment, <laughs> he's around people that understand him. Um, and they're Digimon characters because uh, oh. and so it, they know, after a while they'll know that and, and I'll tell him, you don't wear winter clothes in the summer. And I have to tell him, you can't wear that same shirt every single day. You know, I still have to tell him that. He works and people love him, you know, on his job. He's a stock person. He likes to go in the back and not be bothered by people. And, uh, and at the same time, when he comes home, he's a computer nerd. So he blogs of all these famous people, you know, and he's, so he's two different people. And so it's very interesting what kind of adult they can become you know, once they learn what they're supposed to do at certain situations. And they do rehearse that and use that, you know, and people don't even know the difference. They say, oh, he's so well-mannered and everything. And, and also the eye contact, he knows that he has to do that. And so one time he was interviewing with someone, he said, oh, mom, oh, I'm so glad to get out of there so I don't have to stare, look at people. And he's like, oh, and I, <laughs> oh, so good that I have to do that anymore. And so they do you know, adapt after a while, you know? So you have brought up so many strategies. I don't even know where to begin. Um, I'm going to try to refer back to everything you talked about as we go through this, but you have touched on a number of strategies that we use. But one of the really cool things is you have, um, your son seems to have been able to grow into an environment that fits him best. So um, that's awesome. And he's learned how flexibly to be, 
depend, you know, how to be depending on what situation he's in. And that's really the goal, right? That's the goal for kind of all of us is to know, mm -hmm. like, in this situation, I act in this way. So um, hold those thoughts because we will be talking about the names of all of these strategies that you actually do. <laughs> okay. So, awesome. All right. Um, where are we? Stephanie. Okay. So there's a huge impact socially, emotionally, and academically for students with autism. Just to go into this before we get to the strategies, um, a lot of students who are on the spectrum need um, extra time both to process information and to format and or to format responses to the information. For some of them, the information comes in quite quickly, but they still need the time to be able to, to formulate a response. Um, some students, are, uh, the language skills of students who are on the spectrum is also extremely variable. Some of them are nonverbal. Their communication is not going to be through speaking. And some of them are extremely verbal and they will go at great length to tell you their positions on certain things um, in, in great detail and are very specific. So again, it's very variable. Um, this, the social reaction is, again, we've, we've, mentioned, we've brought this up before, but this is what most people associate with um, people on the, the spectrum. They have difficulty with their peers um, and they tend to play in isolation um, much more often. There's confusion about how they should play with other people. Some of them prefer playing by themselves, um, but it doesn't mean they don't want connections. Kids on the spectrum can be extremely lonely and want friends. They just have difficulty in understanding how to go about making them. Mm -hmm. um, and then we've also dealt with the, the sensory issues where loud noises can be very upsetting. Um, I had a student um, in ninth grade who really struggled with fire drills. It was, they were terrible. And by the time he got to, um, to ninth grade, he was wearing uh, noise blocking headsets as he put, he would put those on as soon as the fire, the fire alarm went off. Now, you may not be able to hear it then, but he knew that he had to follow his teacher out of the room and, you know, do what he needed to do. But it was, in the younger grades, it was terrible. He would hide under the desk. Um, he would refuse to leave and he would just crawl into a little ball. So again, sounds can be unbearable. Same thing with touching. Um, there are kids on the spectrum who cannot bear to be touched in any way, shape or form. And if you want them to calm down, you do not want to approach them too closely either. Because again, the presence can, um, can be really, really difficult for them. Um, um, the same way that um, there are some students on the spectrum who are hyposensitive. In other words, they just don't notice if they're touching something that they shouldn't be, or if their pants are hanging down so low, they're rear end sticks out. And that has major social ramifications as well. And if they don't feel it and they don't notice it, they're going to be the object of bullying, teasing, ridicule. So again, these are all impacts that affect them on, on many levels. Yeah. All right. Okay, so where does this leave us in the classroom? They may have, to, they may struggle with doing group work. And again, a number of the students in my substantially separate classroom do not want to work with their peers. They prefer to work 
on their own. Um, they have trouble following directions or even understanding exactly what I'm talking about. You're going, in a couple of minutes, you're gonna be seeing a video that is gonna point this out incredibly clearly, although I'm sure you've all observed it in your classes as well. Sometimes kids on the spectrum will ask too many questions and they'll perseverate over the question. And one question will lead to another question, which will lead to another question. And then you've lost 10 minutes of your lesson. On the other hand, they may not ask questions when they should ask questions. And um, the other thing is um, working with or approaching teachers and other students inappropriately. They may feel as if they, they can be the teacher or that the teacher is their own peer and that can cause resentment among other students and can be annoying to teachers. Or they may feel like they should instruct their fellow students in the rooms of the classroom or about life in general as they see it if other kids are not acting the way they think they sh the, other, the other students should act. Um, so this can be a real impact. Um, I had my first year of teaching, I had one student who walked into my um, academic support room and went to each girl in the class and would say, hello, my name is Joe. I like your hair. Hello, my name is Joe. I like your dress. Hello, my name is Joe. I like your sweater. And when this first happened, I wasn't quite sure what was going on until the assistant in the room said to me, this is really great because last year he would come in and say, hello, my name is Joe. I like your breasts. So again, this is the sort of thing where the approach, an inappropriate, an inappropriate approach can have very bad consequences. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So some of the other things that can happen, um, hygiene issues. Again, a lot of our guys have a real hard time and need to be told and reminded daily to wash your face, brush your teeth, take a shower, comb your hair, wear different clothing. Um, uh, they don't, because again, if you're only in thinking about your own thoughts and you're not thinking that other people might be having thoughts and those thoughts might be about you, <laughs> then um, it seems kind of like a non-issue, right? Like, oh, so what? But teaching them that, you know, there are social ramifications for if you become the stinky boy, you know, like, and people might not want to be around you when, you know, at work or wherever, if, um, you know, you appear not to be taking care of yourself, then that works for some of our students that help, you know, if they understand that piece. Um, entering and maintaining conversations. This can be really hard for our guys. They, if, you know, think back to that idea of gaze and joint attention. If you don't look at a group before you enter or look at a person before you enter a conversation, you might enter at the wrong time. Um, it could be an inappropriate time. <clears throat> it could be an awkward time. Um, so learning how to enter is really important. Leaving a conversation and maintaining a conversation, also important. I got to the point in my Zoom sessions with my students that I got them to understand that you need to say goodbye before you leave. You don't just like, poof, gone. <laughs> um, but what they missed, like we got to that point and I was like, wait a minute, I'm missing something here. They didn't wait for any kind of response. So it was not an interactive thing. It was like, I'm saying goodbye at you and that's it. And I don't need to know that you're even acknowledging me that I'm leaving. So I changed the rule and the rule was you need to say goodbye and you need to wait until we say goodbye back. <laughs> and that, and then they were like, oh, but for each step of the way, it, you know, it doesn't occur to many of our students that, oh, I should wait until someone says goodbye back. That's the interactive piece. Same thing with maintaining a conversation. A lot of our students want to talk at you and tell you things instead of 
maintaining the, the conversation. As kids get older, this becomes more important because that's how we shall kind of make connections. And um, by the time kids are in middle school and high school, the way you define a friend is someone who gets me. And that means you need theory of mind. You need to be able to take someone's perspective and you need to be able to talk to them, talk to people about different things. Um, this idea of loss of status and not being able to persuade, that's very frustrating if you don't have the language uh, and the perspective taking skills to persuade someone, you can feel kind of powerless at a certain point. Um, and so a lot of our students then kind of, some of them will revert to whining or perseverating. And, um, you know, again, that doesn't typically get you what you want. So teaching kids how to persuade is really important. But social isolation, this is a real problem for a lot of our guys. As Stephanie has said earlier, most of our students want that social interaction. They want friends. Um, <clears throat> but for one of the things that um, we think about is this idea of isolation versus banishment. You know, so if you're far away, banishment is one thing. But when a society really wants to punish someone, they ostracize them, which means you are in the community, but nobody talks to you or acknowledges your existence, right? And that is um, so sad for so many people. For, for students with autism, this is kind of what it's like. It's like you're banished in your own community. You're there, but people aren't really interacting with you so much. So again, very real ramifications for if we're not teaching our students how to um, maintain social interactions. Um, the hugging piece, that can be an issue. Again, this inappropriate use of space or touching. So when we talk to, when our students as they get older and preferably when they're younger, I teach them that the only, this is the safe place from your shoulder to your elbow on the kind of backside is the safe place for touching, uh, no place else. It's one thing if someone gives you a hug when they're five, or they want to sit on your lap when they're five. It's very different if they're 17 and they want to sit in your lap, right? So yeah. understanding that your behaviors change depending on who you're with and what situation you're in. That is something that we really need to start to teach to our students as early as possible because that's going to help them transfer the knowledge from situation to situation. You can't teach a person every single situation. All right. Um, so, I mean, if you think about this, we have problems with social interaction, how we think about social situations and the, how we actually do these things, pragmatics. How do you enter a conversation? How do you maintain a conversation? Um, a lot of our students want friends. They just don't understand why people don't seem to either like them or avoid them or make fun of them. They don't understand it. Um, when they're little, they may not initiate play. Um, when they're in elementary school, they might only be able to play according to their own rules. And so they miss the interaction opportunities that come with cooperative play and being involved in sports. In middle school, they might be left out or teased because they're not following group expectations. And in middle school, you need to follow the group expectations, right? Everyone's trying to figure out where they fit in and how they fit in. <clears throat> In high school, they might lack mature relationships um, that are characterized by this fact, again, that, student, that friends just get each other. So all of these social impacts really do kind of conspire so that many of our students are not having the satisfactory social uh, life that we would like them to have. All right, Linda <clears throat> or Stephanie. Well, both of you. Okay. Well, again, uh, Helen has talked about taking the perspective of others. Um, I just, before we go on with this, I was noticing some of the comments which were really interesting, um, especially uh, the last one from Patricia um, about how in some situations people can be incredibly nice and kind and inclusive. Um, on the other hand, there are times, especially as they get older in middle school and high school, where people who were their friends don't 
don't want to be when with them younger, anymore. All of a sudden, don't want to associate them. Yeah, because in middle school, being like everybody else is really important. And if someone isn't like everybody else, then you can be an out, be considered an outcast as well. So it's really, um, it's interesting, but it's it's also it can be heartbreaking. Right. Um, it is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking yeah. for them. It's heartbreaking for mom and dad. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's kind of like they they start out sort of parallel in a lot of ways, and then the gap, the social gap, actually grows as they get older. Um, so that that's one of the the reasons that you want to work so hard on this is the closer you can keep them to being similar to their peers um mm -hmm. the better their life is going to be right <clears throat> right and um for me as a parent um in working with a lot of students the social piece is the most critical piece. Academics will always come. There's always time. Um, the younger and the more adjustments that you can help them make when they're on their social spec on their social things, the better their whole life will be. And and there's a limited window there. We're going to talk uh, just a little bit more about the functional impacts here. Um, the, these guys might not be aware if they're being manipulated, and this can have really serious ramifications. Like, often our students would be the one that will say, yes, I will carry that suitcase across the airport for you. <laughs> Someone has been friendly with them. And so understanding people's motives and intentions and reading the language around if people are being manipulated or not is something that's very difficult for our students. Um, that, you know, uh, this idea of being able to repair communication breakdowns is really very important. It doesn't sound like much, but you have to repair communication breakdowns in stores, online. Imagine, have any of you had to call a help desk for your cable or computer, imagine not be as frustrating enough, but if you can't repair those communication breakdowns because you're not aware that someone's not understanding you, it can become very frustrating. Um, if you don't realize you've offended someone, how do you fix that? So that one's really important. Um, if you're not attending to the thoughts and actions of others, uh, if you can't appreciate what someone will do, then how do you participate in group work and in team sports and other kind of team activities, right? All of those require you to be thinking about what other people are doing and thinking. Same thing with tone, right? I have some students who sound angry all the time. They're not angry. You know, they'll, they'll come in and they'll be like, I just got a new toy. You know, and you're like, oh, <laughs> well then, okay, <laughs> you sound a little upset by that. <laughs> so modeling the right tone of voice for these guys is pretty important, but also telling them, gee, you know, labeling how they sound and the tone of voice. You sound angry right now. Are you angry? Is that what you mean to express? That really helps them be like, oh, wait a minute. Oh, no, I'm not angry. I'm actually pretty happy right now. And so practicing with them and modeling for them how you show that you're excited or happy or frustrated or angry or sad through your tone of voice uh, is pretty important for these guys. Okay, so now we're gonna show you a video. And um, this I'm really does pull yeah. everything together for yeah. you. Know, <laughs> what happens or what can happen to a person and uh, or how they're experiencing wanted, um, Kimberly made a comment uh, a few minutes ago that is so important um, about her student uh, for six years whose, whose father was in denial 
And mm -hmm. this just speaks to the important work that you do with your students every single day. Um, where you, he may not have had the proper support at home, but as she said, having the proper support at school made a huge difference. And you know, this is where you, you save one life, you save the world. Yeah. 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 Pretty crazy. Yeah. All right. What did you think? <clears throat> what did you think of Hannah's experience? <clears throat> To me, that perfectly captures what can happen, right? Like, ev all of these things made perfect sense to her. Perfect sense. Um, but it brings us to this idea that we have to remember that uh, for, you can't assume that our students are really following along with everything we're saying, right? So she took that word relationship and didn't understand that it has more than one meaning and automatically assumed that it needed to be a family relationship or you know somehow like that as opposed to a spatial relationship right so um but when we saw this we were thinking this so embodies how, what is happening for so many of our students and then they do get in trouble like they get in trouble like the teacher clearly thought she was being fresh she wasn't being fresh she really wanted to know she also didn't understand that she was asking too many questions. She didn't understand that most other people thought her questions were not relevant, right? So they're like, what are all these random questions? They seemed random as opposed to relevant. But she and, on the, mm -hmm. and on the other hand, I think the teacher's um, approach to this was mm. not exactly effective, not only for Hannah, but probably for half the other class, the rest yeah. of the class as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. so what are we going to do now? We're going to look at strat. Um, okay, so these are some of the accommodations that are in the IEP uh, for kids on the spectrum. Let them have sensory breaks, giving them specific clues. Being concrete is huge. Um, and again, that's a strategy we'll get into in a couple minutes. Um, limiting the number of steps and directions, chunking information. Again, concrete language and using visuals. This is what you'll see on the IEP and they roll over into the strategies that we are going to um, discuss now. Yeah. There's a, Kathleen Lydon put in um, a short play. She, she wrote something in the chat that I think is very appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were doing a short play in her classroom and one of the students thought he had to become the animal that was his character. So he was tr trying to growl and crawl like a jaguar and the teacher was not <laughs> happy about this. So she tried to change his role and she made him a bird thinking that that would be, you know, better. And uh, he started cawing and flapping his wings. So, <laughs> so she missed the very literal piece that was happening here for this poor guy um, and didn't you know, speak to that. Mm. Yeah, this is what we see. All right. Okay, so um, these are some of the strategies that that work really well with these kids. Um, Again, they always say, if you know one person with autism, you know one person with autism. So the best place to start is with the IEP, um, looking at their testing, um, looking at their strengths and weaknesses, um, because every, every student is going to be different. And... Um, how you interact with your student is going to depend on where they are at that at that point in their lives. Okay, when when you're monitoring social interactions and you're watching for bullying, you're watching for bullying both ways. Um, our students can be bullied. They can also become bullies because they are insisting that it's their way or the highway. 
So you need to watch for that. And that's a really good teachable moment about other people's feelings and going to theory of mind um, when they become consistent. Big picture ideas. They're, they tend to folk, a lot of these kids tend to focus on the minutia and the small details instead of the big picture. If they're studying something in history, they may be great with the dates, but not so good with the whys. Why did this happen? Um, so you want to really make sure that they get those big picture ideas. Space is important to them. And giving, um, working out a cue for them to ask for space is really good. Being concrete. Um, I always go back to, and I don't even know if these are published anymore, but there was a series of kids books, Amelia Bedelia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, she was literal. Um, she housed that in one book and they told her to change the curtains and she cut big shapes out of them because that's how she thought she should change them, not take them down and put new ones up. So the more concrete you can be, um, the better. Inference, assumption, sarcasm, and idioms. These are all things that are difficult for our kids. Um, if you can, you want to avoid them when you're giving directions, but also if you have time, you know, trying to teach these things to them can be very useful, again, for their entire life. Um, I taught Alex sarcasm at home, and the rule was that you know, he could only practice with me until mm -hmm. we decided he was ready. And it probably took three years, you know, and it was, no, that's not sarcastic, that's hurtful. Um, but again, any of these things that you can teach them, it just makes their life richer, fuller, it makes them more acceptable to um, their peers. Uh, changes in schedule. Mm -hmm. You really want to go over changes in schedule, especially if they're more if they're a more rigid student. Um, timed work sessions is great. You know, you only have to work for 15 minutes and then you can take a break and just kind of work on extending that as they're comfortable with it. And shortening assignments is um, also really good. If they can, if they're doing math and they, um, they're doing math instead of doing 30 problems, they only need to do 10. It's just when you do that, you need to make sure that you pick what they're doing, okay? So that they get the full range of whatever the assignment is. Um, a number of these uh, Linda's already talked about. Um, one thing I wanted to add about um, the um, giving advance notice of any changes in set routines, that's really import important and it also will avoid some anxiety and possibly acting out, but they also have to realize that there will be changes in life. Life does not always follow the same set routine. So it's important to talk to them about this. We're changing the routine because this, this, and this is going to happen. We will go back to our routine later on, but we may change it up again. Again, as, as Helen said, it, it encourages uh, flexible thinking. Um, giving fewer choices is something else. Not only kids on the spectrum, but if you make things too open-ended, um, for kids with executive function issues, for example, they may not even begin, be able to begin to start. So fewer choices sometimes is a much better approach. Um, anything that we say really needs to be taught from the time the kids are little and repeated as they go along until it's, 
as automatic as is possible. So again, teaching special social rules and the skills involved, that has to start from pre-kindergarten and keep being reviewed as social rules change as kids get older. Um, if possible, avoiding overstimulation because again, you really, you wanna make sure that the kids feel safe and, and can control their emotions and their activity. Um, and then just letting kids have some time to think about their response. Um, we said before that, um, that some that kids on the spectrum very often need additional time. They need extended time to understand directions, to process the directions, and also to um, to respond to directions or to information in general. Um, and then things like using checklists and scripts so that they know what to do in specific situations can also be really, really helpful. So I'm these are, that's what you were talking about earlier, right? Yeah. Like helping your son, you're giving him scripts. This is what, mm -hmm. yes. what to yep. do. Right? Yes, that really helped, helps a lot. Definitely helps these guys. Yeah. And I also gave checklists to checklists. Um, especially when they are older as adults, they have their own apartment and we are all in the same building though, which is great. Oh, that's awesome. And so I give them checklists so that when they're on their own, they know what to do day to day. And right. his, his other son, I mean, my other son has intellectual disability as I put in. Um, yeah, I saw that. And so yeah. they both live in the same apartment, I mean, same awesome. building, but in different apartments. And so, yeah. you know, they both have checklists. Um, yeah. Right, cute. These yeah. are very important. I mean, again, they seem like simple things, but they can, uh, you know, rock a kid's world be, and give them independence and give them the tools they need to be able to function successfully. Sorry, Steph, go ahead. Oh, no, that's okay. Um, I think we also, Linda, Linda spoke about keeping language simple and concrete, mm -hmm. and that, again, is hugely important. And also, if a student is asking too many questions or is asking inappropriate questions, um, one thing, one in inclusion classes, uh, some teachers have a policy of allowing everybody in the class two questions in, or three questions in the class period. And when they've used up their questions, they need to write them down and hand them in to the teacher at the end of class and the teacher will go over it with them individually. Um, and that's, that's also something that where um, it can be very supportive as, um, as an instructional assistant if you help them write down the questions or if you work with them on what questions are appropriate and what questions may not be appropriate for the whole class to know. Fabulous. Um, okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about bullying. And as I said before, you need to monitor because, because our kids are missing those social cues they're not always going to understand when they're being bullied. Um, and it's, it's something, it's something that we need to teach um, them to look out for, but it's also something that, especially with younger kids, we need to intervene in that, in that situation and protect our students. Um, because people can be cruel. Mm -hmm. um, you can use, uh, if you feel like your student is being bullied or is in fact bullying someone else, you can use um, cues to get their attention to you. And if you need to um, have that conversation as soon as possible. Um, a lot of people use sticky notes on a desk, um, mm -hmm. little, little reminders, 
asking students about previous interactions, um, this is going to really depend more on where they are on the spectrum and also their age. Um, most of our guys are going to remember some things really specifically and then some things not at all. So again, it's, it's you observing what's going on in the classroom. Mm -hmm. a lot of times, oh, I'm sorry, can I just say something? Yeah. No. A lot of times our guys, again, they don't understand the motives or intentions of, of other people and they just assume that because someone's friendly to them that that person is automatically their friend. Um, and so what we try to teach them and they should start learning early on is look at a person's pattern of behavior across time. So that's something we would be looking at when we're asking our students about the interactions with others. But it's also important to have that conversation with your student. How have they treated you across time? Then you can make a decision about if this behavior is mean and bullying or not. If normally they're very nice to you and they do something or say something you think might be bullying, there's a good chance it's not. But if they've always ignored you and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, and they, they say something mean, well, then you might assume that that's bullying. So that's a really important piece for um, assistants to be developing with their students. So, sorry, go ahead, Linda. Um, and the, it's hard. Um, it's hard not to take their behavior or their comments personally because sometimes they really do hurt. Um, and you have to remember where where they're coming from. It's also a teachable moment. You know, it's it's great for you to say to them. When you say that to me, it makes me feel like, it makes me feel sad. It makes me feel um, that you don't like me or that I'm unworthy or whatever feelings you wanna put in there. Um, and that's a good way for them to understand that they need to stop saying those kind of comments and to transfer that, not just from you, not saying those things to you, but saying those things to everyone. And again, it makes their life better for their entire life. Okay, so the hidden rules, the unwritten rules. Um, these are all of the assumed kind of rules or the expectations that we have for any given situation. No one teaches us these things. We just know, for instance, you just kind of know how you behave in an elevator, right? When you walk into an elevator, what do you do? Do you go stand right next to the other person who's in the elevator? No, no. you go stand on the side of the elevator. Do you stare at the person in the elevator? No, everybody faces forward, right? And you, if there are two people in the elevator, you take as far as much space as you can. Well, who taught you that? Did you learn elevator rules in school? Did a teacher teach you that? No. So unwritten rules are the rules of any given situation um, where we all kind of know what the expected behaviors are. Our guys don't get this. So think about Hannah. She said, I don't get the memo, right? I didn't get that memo. <laughs> it's the same kind of Thing. They need to be taught these things explicitly. So again, Amatul, in this situation, this is what you say or this is what you do. And to Linda's point, if you start saying this stuff and think you're being sarcastic in this situation, that is not appropriate, right? We don't typically bring up sarcasm when we're at a funeral or, um, you know, those, those types of situations. Um, but they do govern how people interact with each other. So these unwritten rules, um, you know, you'll pay, you'll play a huge role for your students in this and helping them to understand that when we're in the library, we're quiet, you know, in this room, the teacher allows us to get up and sharpen our pencil five times and she's okay with it. But guess what? In this room, that teacher doesn't like that. 
So giving them the unwritten pieces, which means you really have to kind of be detectives yourselves and think about, all right, what are the unwritten rules in this situation? Um, the one that I often bring up is this idea of raising your hand. A lot of teachers give a rule that you must raise your hand to answer a question. And then they call on people who don't raise their hands. So what's the unwritten rule? The unwritten rule doesn't matter what the rule is. The unwritten rule is if you yell out an answer, the teacher is going to call on you. And so yelling out an answer is okay. Just kind of fascinating how these things happen. Um, one thing you can do is use the one a day strategy and just once a day teach an unwritten rule, right? Every day, just teach one unwritten rule. Hey, by the way, this is what happens in the lunchroom. You don't just go sit at a group of people. You don't just try to share a seat with someone, right? You, you know, like, um, that, that those are kind of really important things to do. All right. So, Linda, you want to talk about these three unwritten rules? The unwritten rules that go with these three situations? Yep. Um, so again, um, they're pretty global in their thinking. So if they're if they're swearing at home, if they're swearing with their friends, they're going to swear in the classroom <laughs> because it's global. Um, so these are really three things that you need to teach them are not global. And the more specific you can be, the better off they're going to be. Um, for example, with strangers, um, my son, when we're gone, will be in a group home for the simple reason that stranger danger is something he has never been able to conceive. If he were living on his own and someone walked up to him on the street and said, I have no place to live, he would take them home yeah. because that's who he is. Um, mm -hmm. If you can teach them about strangers and who the exceptions are, um, like the policeman, the fireman, um, that's great. Sometimes it, it's really hard. Interrupting, um, interrupting, if you can break them from the habit of interrupting and get them to really hang on to a thought, huge. Um, again, it makes conversation better for them. It makes interacting with people better for them. And again, it goes for their whole life. You know, you, you teach them strategies about these things when they're in school and when they're 60, they're still using them and their life has been better for all those years. When we think about the unwritten rules of swearing for a lot of our students, because they're rule bound, they think no one should swear. No one should swear ever. You never swear. <laughs> and um, when we think about teenagers and younger kids, fitting in really involves looking and sounding like you fit in. So a lot of teenagers swear. So teaching kids the unwritten rule that teenagers swear and that people who are in groups together, if they all agree that swearing is okay, then it's okay, is an important rule for them to understand. It's unwritten because think about when they're little, they're brought up, the rule is you don't swear, you don't swear, you never swear. Well, then all of a sudden things change and guess what? Sometimes people swear. So that's pretty important that we understand around some of these behaviors, right? Same thing with interrupting. Sometimes it's okay to interrupt. It's okay to interrupt if there's an emergency. If your friend's bleeding on the ground, guess what? You get to interrupt the teacher. But a lot of kids are brought up that the rule is you don't interrupt when people are talking. So 
understanding the nuances of a situation is really what you're doing when you're helping kids with the unwritten rules. All right, so Temple Grandin and Sean Barron-Cohn um, came up with this, these 10 unwritten rules of social relationships. Um, so beyond the situational curriculum of the school, we have these unwritten rules of social relationships. And uh, when kids with autism don't follow them, they get into trouble. So um, I want to just take a look at these quickly. The first one is that rules are not absolute. So think about all our students with their cognitive rigidity, right? Everything is a rule. Well, teaching them that rules are not absolute is pretty important. Um, my guys will get stuck on this and want to try to find a way to logic out of it. Like they want to catch me in this one. Well, then isn't that rule absolute? You know, like they go, but they miss. What they miss is the second piece. They get so focused on that first piece, rules are absolute, that they miss the piece about rules of situation and people based. If we can teach them that it depends on the person, the, the people you're with and the situation you're in, then they can start to transfer that across situations. And that part is pretty important. All right, the second one, not everything is equally important in the grand scheme of life. I have students who will yell at the top of their lungs because they broke their pencil, right? The same way they would yell at the top of their lungs if they broke their leg. So <laughs> not everything is equally important and helping them understand that is really important. You can use just a, a, a very easy scale with guys and I do this with my students a lot. You just make a draw a quick line, you know, and say, how important is this? Very important, not important at all. And let them start to even see it. The visuals are really important for our guys. So anytime you can do this, if you need to use it in terms of tactiles, put th place three blocks in front of them and then say, touch the one that tells you how important this is. So um, they need to understand that there are nuances. <laughs> if you respond to everything, people stop taking you seriously. We don't want that to happen to our guys. Um, the next one, everyone in the world makes mistakes, right? So wouldn't it be nice if we could all think this way, right? And it doesn't have to ruin your day. It really doesn't have to ruin your day. I think this is a hard one, but um, helping kids to understand how you regulate your emotions, that's what two and three really are all about. Um, it doesn't have to ruin your day. Sometimes our guys really get stuck. They make a mistake and they're stuck. Um, so help them understand this one. And even I put things up in my room. I have a and I'll point to them. You know what? It was a mistake. Um, and modeling the fact that we all make mistakes is really important. Linda does this in her class. She actually has the students try to catch her and make mistakes. And if they catch her in a certain way, <laughs> give them a Starbucks gift card. So like she makes sure that they know everybody makes mistakes. Really, really important. Um, honesty is different from diplomacy. These guys pride themselves on being honest. Have you ever met anyone who prides themselves on being brutally honest? Yeah. How much time do you want to spend with that person? Not much. Right. Not much. Um, honesty can be hurtful. So teaching our guys to understand the difference between honesty and diplomacy is huge, right? And I don't think I need to say more about that one. Um, you know, this next one, this is, this is Temple Grandin. I love Temple Grandin. I just love her. And part of this is because of number five, right? Being polite is appropriate in any situation. So and that is what um, Amatul spoke of when yeah. we first started. Right. So just being polite and teaching that as the rule, right? Like it's appropriate in any. Um, there are some, it's, there is something to be said for some non-negotiable rules. So when Temple Grandin was growing up, rules were pretty consistent across settings. And she says her mother saved her life because her mother made her follow all the rules just like every other of her children, right? She wasn't allowed to be different. It was like, no, we're all sitting at the table. You will sit at the table. Same thing across settings, right? So the parents all tended to have the same kind of rules. So you knew 
So some level of consistency was pretty important. We don't have that same level now, and so things can be more um, confusing for students, not just students with autism. Um, Helen, mm -hmm. it is now 11.58. Uh, um, all right. We can, we can go over for a little bit, but if you have to leave at 12, yeah. please don't feel like you, you know, we're forcing you to right. stay or anything. Yeah. Um, so, um, right. you know, again, Right. Thank you. If, right. if you're leaving now, thank you for coming. Otherwise, we're going to just keep moving we'll for keep moving a few forward. more minutes. Yep. So if you take a look at this next set of rules, um, again, back to what you were talking about, Amatul, uh, it's really important for people to know that people act differently in public than they do in private. And that that's okay, right? So you can have your stuffed animal in private, but you probably shouldn't have it in public because yeah. people show a different face when they're in public. And again, when you don't have good theory of mind, understanding that can be very difficult for our students. So um, you really wanna look like you fit in. I had a student who dyed his hair purple and put it into a huge mohawk. And then he came to me and he was very angry one day. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, everybody's looking at me. And I'm like, well, you have a purple mohawk and yesterday you had you know, straight blonde hair. What do you want me to say to you? So if you want to fit in, you basically have to look and sound like you fit in. You have to use the same types of language and you need to wear sort of the same types of clothing. All right. Um, there are only a couple more strategies that we want to try to get through here. And the first one is social stories. Again, Amatul, this is kind of back to what you were talking about. Social stories are really important for our students. They basically give you a set of rules for how to understand a situation before you go into it or how to understand a situation after you've left it. You can do this for your students all the time. Social stories often have visuals because our guys with autism really benefit from visuals. So providing them with a few words and a picture to let them know what's coming in a situation is really, really, really important. Yes. Um, these social skills help you to you know, help you explain why you use self-care skills, right? You can use them to teach how you brush your teeth or wash your hands. You can use them to help you understand how you respond in a particular situation. They help you understand the perspective of other people. So um, really important. They basically tell you the where, the when, the who, the what, and the how and why. So it's mostly short descriptive sentences. And this is just an example of one short descriptive sentences that kind of tell you the who, what, where, when, why, and how. So if we're returning to school, this is a social story I might use with some of my students with autism. It's an illness that makes people sick. A wearing a mask can help everyone stay healthy. When I go to school, I will wear a mask. There's the expectation. I might feel uncomfortable at first, letting them know what's coming, this is okay. That's really important. Uh, the more I practice my mask, the easier it will be to wear. So we're setting students up for what they will need to do in a given situation. <clears throat> um, and you can do that four or five sentences is really all you need. On the same token, we have this idea of comic strip conversations. Same thing. They help us make things more concrete. These are really important because they help represent people's thoughts and their words. So people can, kids can see that sometimes the words and the thoughts will be different. Um, and I, you don't have to be a great artist to do these. I do these with stick figures all the time. Make a little thought bubble. Let kids, let kids in on the secret of what someone else is thinking. And here's just a quick example of that, right? You know, they look cool. I want to talk to them. And so what does he say? He says, hey, my beanie baby just ripped. And what are people thinking? Whoa, what just happened here? And dude, you're a bit old for a beanie baby, aren't you? And wow, pretty random. But what do they say? Uh, sorry? Or, oh, what a shame. So showing the differences is really effective for our students. And the last thing I want to talk about is this idea of Behavior is communication. We've talked about this, right? So when someone bites or hits or screams or spins, like these, there are reasons for this. 
So think about the patterns and think about what's causing that so that you can then help to replace whatever that behavior is. That piece is very important. Think about how the child communicates. So. Our last slide um, is something that we would like you to think about, and that's called the social model of disability. It's a very interesting clip um, about these mm -hmm. two different models of looking at disability, one being the medical model where a disability is something that can be fixed or by doctors mm -hmm. or by interventions. The social model of disability is something that looks, it's a model that looks at the environment um, surrounding a person and the environment can in fact trigger the disability in the person. So that if you can manipulate the environment, all of a sudden it's not a disability. So it is something that we would like you to, to know about um, and it can inform some, sometimes the way you work with your students where if you make sure the environment is safe and you can modify it so that it doesn't um, trigger responses um, for your students on the spectrum, it can make a world of difference. Yep. And then our last couple of slides here, I just wanted you to be aware of some of the things that um, go on for students with severe autism or significant autism. Lots of people um, will use the applied behavioral analysis approach with our students. Um, it's a technique that uh, is still used today. It comes, we have um, discrete trial training. So a lot of this is based in positive reinforcement of behaviors. It's very data-driven. Uh, and very, very structured. So if you're working in substantially separate programs, these are some of the things that you might see. An ABA approach where you will be required to take data um, and do very small pieces. We break any task down into the very smallest pieces and we train each piece to success. Um, PECS is another type of communication system where students are used, are taught to communicate using pictures that they exchange for what they want. So just be aware that that could be something that you'll see in your classrooms. Token systems are when we're rewarding students for the behavior that we see that we want them to do. And eventually when they get a certain amount of tokens, which could be stickers, uh, stars, check marks, they get to exchange that for something that they want. So again, more reinforcing of the behaviors that we want to see. Visual schedules are huge. For our guys, we talked about the fact that they are very visual. Um, let them see the change, let them manipulate the changes themselves. That's very, very important for these guys so they know what's coming. It's also uh, important to use when we know that there's going to be something different going on. And then, lastly, some of your students might have communication devices, so they may be nonverbal and they may be using alternative communication. It's really important that you use this with your students. Most, if you're in this situation, you'll be trained how to work with your student with a device. Um, some of, some people get to know a student well and don't feel like they need the system. But the point is that the student needs the system because they need it across life. So to be able to communicate in all different types of environments, which brings us to this last one, which is that our students really need to be able to function across all settings. So when you're working with your students, keep in mind that you will be helping them with everything they're learning with you. They need to know for home. They might need it for work. They might need it if they go to the doctors. They might need it to have fun. And um, they might need it to just be figuring out how to travel. So um, that's kind of it for us. I know we kind of blew through those last ones, trying to really honor your time here. But take a look at that link on the social model. Here are our emails if you have any questions or concerns. Any of us are more than happy to field questions from you um, around this or other, you know, other things that we may not have uh, been able to touch on in our short two hours today. So um, we'll be doing we'll be doing another workshop next Thursday on um, language 
uh, la language uh, disorders. Um, so if you have time, drop by and see us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So again, we appreciate your time. Uh, we are passionate about we, what we do, and it's pretty clear to us that you're pretty passionate about what you do. Uh, we have a lot of pretty lucky students out there. Yeah.